Uh, all right, in chapter number six, we discussed uh, how the formation of our solar system. We surveyed the solar system and we stopped here, planets orbiting other stars. So now, uh, astronomers look at evidence of ongoing planet formation. Uh, we talked about the Orion Nebula. If you look at uh, the constellation of Orion, there is a Nebula in, in that location as well. And they can find uh, young uh, stars with dust disks around them. And that basically the evidence or the support for the solar nebula uh, hypothesis. And uh, some of the sites basically are uh, planet formation right now, because when you look at things, you actually see them in the past. We don't see them right now. But there are these type of uh, what we call maybe evidence or direct images of what we call ongoing uh, planet uh, formation. Uh, in chapter number nine, we'll talk about what a T-Tori is. A T-Tori basically uh, what we call a proto a star. That's basically one stage before uh, the star forms. And this is a young star with some uh, dust uh, disks around them. And that's basically a star formation. And maybe it becomes also as a planetary system. So these are observed, which lend support to the hypothesis. And at the same time, that's the ongoing formation of uh, planets. But when we want to look at uh, a planet, which we call here extra solar planets, or we call exo planets. And these are planets orbiting around other stars, not the sun. So I don't want you to make the mistake, uh, the, you, you, I don't want you to be confused. When we say extrasolar, that means they are in our solar system, but somewhere an extra. No. When we say extrasolar planets, that mean planets orbiting other stars, not the uh, sun. Now, uh, I told you uh, in one of the bonuses that you have to go and look at Venus uh, uh, in the west just after sunset and you actually venus is the third brightest object in the night sky and you see how small it is now and this is within uh, our solar uh, system and i told you the distance between the earth and the sun it is 150 million kilometers and venus is between us and the sun now imagine if you are basically looking at other stars. And I told you that the nearest star to us is Proxima Centauri, which is 4.2 light years away. So, and the planets usually do not produce light on their own. They only reflect the light that they get from the star. So imaging extrasolar planets or uh, uh, orbiting other stars is not going to be, it cannot be done directly. So that's something that we, that they will have very small uh, surface area if compared to the star, and they're far away, so it's not going to be as easy as the planets that we see in our solar system. Here. So we have to rely on other techniques to decide if there is an extrasolar uh, planet or a planet orbiting uh, the star. So usually when we look at a star, we look at something that we call wobbling or a wobble. And when this happens, that means basically there's something that's affecting the star and probably they're going around the center of mass and that most likely probably the planet or the effect of the planets on the star. So how do we do that? Okay. Or how do we basically look at that? 
stars are far away. So how can we decide on that? So we actually, in looking at exoplanets, it has to be actually indirect. So before I just go into this, I just wanted to uh, look at this cartoon that we have here. Uh, a lady with a dog and the dog is on a leash and the dog is trying to run around the lady so she can stay in the center. But what happens if the lady has more than one dog and they're all trying to run around the lady and of course she is basically holding them with each dog with a leash. The lady cannot really stay in the center. She will be basically wobbling around. And that's sometimes what uh, astronomers start looking at is there is a wobble that then there is an effect of something that uh, pulling on the uh, on the star. And from this, basically, they can decide on that. So now if you want to make a plot uh, of 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 uh, of this, where e on the x-axis you have time, and on the y-axis here you have velocity. In this case, you will have a a regular motion, and you see that wave. Now, in this case here, you will see this effect, which we call what we call a wobble. So the way we do that we observe something that we call a Doppler shift, okay? And from this Doppler shift, we can decide on the wobble of the motion, then we find a common, uh, the common center of mass, and then we can basically decide on the masses of these planetary systems. So I'll try to do my best to explain this uh, Doppler shift and how physicists basically use that. Now, if you have a wave, okay, and we talked about that in chapter, and I'm not really a good drawer, okay. Uh, we talked about that from here to here is a wavelength. And we talked that in the case of electromagnetic waves, the speed of light equal the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. So now imagine if a detector is here and then you have a source here that sends in waves and the detector will try to measure these uh, waves. Now the detector will measure the wavelength because they will get the crust and then they will get the next crust and they measure that. That's in the case if the source is stationary. What happens if the source is moving? Well, if the source is moving, then the uh, detector will get the crust. And since the source is moving toward the detector, the second crust will not give you the real wavelength of the wave here. It will give you the wavelength minus delta change, which we call delta lambda here, because the wave will look shorter. It seems shorter because the object is, or the source is moving toward the source, uh, toward the detector here. So it it means that, that if you can measure the shift in the wave, then you can say something about the speed of the uh, source. And the same way, if you have the source, but the source is moving that way, and that's the detector here, and of course it will be sending waves toward the detector. Now the detector will get this, the first uh, uh, crust, and then as the source is moving away, the wavelength will seem a little bit longer. So you will have something.
something here plus the shift in the wave and in this case the wave seems to be a little bit longer so that shift again will tell you something about the speed of the source this shift here in the wave that's what we call a doppler shift and that's exactly uh, how the the uh, detectors on the highways basically detect the speeds of cars they can do it either way if the car is approaching or if the car is moving away they will always look at the shift and from that shift they can basically decide on the speed of the car so we look at the shift so in astronomy sometimes they want to look if there is a shift and most of the time uh, since we use visible light but uh, that that doesn't have to be visible light but remember in chapter number five we talked about the uh, range of the wavelength from 400 to 700 nanometers where you go from violet all the way to red so the longer wavelength is red and the shorter basically will go toward the violet but usually we tend to go uh, we tend to look at the blue more so you may hear this word in astronomy when they say red shift and they say blue shift okay the idea of a red shift is basically when the source is moving away from you that means you're going toward longer wavelengths that's what red shift mean okay now a blue uh, shift it means that the source basically moving toward you that means moving toward short wavelengths so i just want to tell you what a Doppler effect is it's basically a shift in the wavelength and when an object is approaching you the wavelength seems to be a little bit shorter and when the wave is moving away from you that means it is longer so when you go you shift longer we say that this is red shift and when we go shorter we say this is blue shift it could happen in any wavelength by the way it doesn't have to be blue or red but that's what we're using here by the way sound has to do with the frequency but the speed let's say if i told you that the speed of light is constant but even if you, if you do that in sound the speed of, of sound will stay constant in the air for you but if the wave becomes shorter that means the frequency is going to become higher and that's why when things approach you they seem to be louder because of that shift which we call a doppler shift and of course it will give you a shift in the frequency toward higher pitch but when they're moving away from you you're going to get a uh, longer wavelength which is a smaller uh, frequency and that's why the sound will seem a little bit fainter as it goes away so that's what a Doppler shift is and you will hear that a lot when you uh, listen to astronomers they always talk about red shift if it's going toward longer wavelengths it's uh, blue shift it's going toward shorter wavelengths so that's basically what they look at so that's the technique that it's used when they look at uh, stars is the stars receding or approaching and they look at the shift and then from the shift basically they can decide on the speeds and it's more involved but they basically can get to know about what is causing that now uh, this was i think the first technique used in detecting exoplanets uh, i told you we live on a galaxy just our own galaxy which is the milky way and it depends on how far you want to go in the galaxy uh, we chose a diameter of 100 uh, light years it could be extended to 120 light years 
So, and you know, use statistics to come at the approximate number of stars. So we say between 200 to 400 billion stars. And we're all, the sun is one of them. And we happen to have a planets orbiting the sun. One of them is the earth and we're here. So what are the chances that other stars will have the same situation, let alone the number of galaxies that we have in the universe? So it was presumed that uh, uh, planets orbiting other stars should be common, but they were not observed, at, I think, until the uh, 1993, 1992 with this technique here. So in 2019, the uh, Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, James Pebble for his work on cos cosmology and uh, Michelle Meyer and uh, Dieter Golas for the discovery of an exoplanet orbiting a solar type star. I think there are some people who observed things before, but they did not explain them. Uh, and I think uh, Dieter was basically able to explain that as uh, the effect of exosolar planets. And of course, from analysis, you decide what the size on. So from that time on, this is when uh, astronomers start basically paying attention to exoplanets and now they have evidence for the existence of exoplanets, but it's not direct. I told you uh, they're far away, so it will not be that easy. Direct detection of extrasolar planets, it will be in very exceptional uh, cases when we look at the infrared and that's usually you know I told you yourself you're emitting infrared so when uh, a planet is still form uh, still warm in formation and so on they may actually infrared emit infrared light and if you compare it to the stars it may be possible but it's not uh, really a, uh, a common thing. So you, this is what we have here, a near infrared image of a planet orbiting about 120 AU from a star. So we have to rely on this. There are many other techniques, things called macro lensing. Uh, we're not going to go into that, but there is one uh, technique which is known as a transient light. And the idea of this technique, you look at a star and you look at the brightness of the star. So you have here the relative brightness here and you try to basically measure this brightness. Now, if there is something orbiting the star, and it can transit between you and the star. So if a planet will come here and it covers an area of the star, then that area of the star is blocked and that will result in a dip in the observed brightness. And as soon as this basically comes here, so it moves from this location here, then the brightness will go back. So you always look for this, and this is known as a transient light curve. And that's also another technique. Now I think it's, uh, we use this transient more in seeing uh, exoplanets. Before it was what we call the radial velocity. It based on from the uh, Doppler, shift but you know you it always takes some time to fine-tune techniques and so on so as of this uh, this month june and uh, 2021 there are about four uh, thousand and four hundred and one confirmed 
exoplanets. And the number is rising. I think in 2010 or something like this, the number was about 200. In about 10 years, the number has gone to 4,400. And presumed to be common, but we actually need uh, this. Uh, there is a site that you can visit. And this site will basically, it's an archive where they archive uh, uh, all of, uh, of these. That's now uh, something that I took from that uh, archive where uh, the color basically gives you the technique of this so you can see the relative or the radial velocity and radial velocity is coming from the Doppler shift in red and you can see the red here so you can see from the early part of the 1990s we're relying on this technique uh, and then the transient method basically start taking over and now most of what we uh, see uh, in exoplanets is basically coming from this transient method. Of course, there is other techniques. We're not going to go uh, through them. But the idea here that astronomers now observe exoplanets. That means a planet orbiting other stars. So we are not unique. Uh, at the beginning, uh, they were basically observing uh, planets that are basically very huge, very close. So they used to call them hot, hot Jovian. They're made of gaseous, but they're big, okay, uh, and they're very close. So they're hot. In our case here, Jovian are further away from the sun, which are cooler, but in, they, in, in that case, they're very hot. So they usually astronomers when they try to look at these exoplanets they always try to find out uh, are they are in the habitable zone a zone where life can exist like our own uh, situation here in earth so they always try to look for that uh, for, I mean, there are some evidence that might be, and you may hear from time to time that uh, they found uh, a planet which is comparable in size to the Earth, but it's basically a runaway planet or something. I think that was last year. They captured something, but they said maybe it's uh, by itself uh, roaming around or something like that. But they're always looking for that. But it's not something easy. Uh, to do but the number is increasing and probably the techniques will be improved more and more so our situation or the solar system if we want to regard it as a planetary system is not unique there are other planetary systems but the question is is there any situation resembling our own situation where a planet is in the habitable zone, meaning that it can support life. So with this, basically, we cap uh, chapter number six. This is just the last part here that I want to touch on. Now, probably I will go to that side just to uh, show you the uh, site. So I'll I'll share my whole uh, screen with you. And I will show you, this is the archive here where you have, uh, so if you go there, they will tell you on 2nd of June, 4,401 confirmed the planets. They use techniques there, they will give you the different things. So if you're interested, you can go to the site and uh, they may also give you images and graphs and things like that so transient surveys here which is known as the tes and the confirmed planets 
So this is basically a site where uh, it keeps a track of uh, uh, this. Uh, and this is basically the uh, end of this. The next thing that I'm going to do here is basically I'm going to look at review uh, questions as usual. And these are, they can serve as a discussion as well for us. But do you have any questions? If you have any questions, you can basically uh, uh, let me share my screen to go to the uh, review questions. Do you have any questions so far? Any questions? So the first uh, uh, question that we have here, the Napular theory of the origin of the solar system was proposed by Laplace and I told you that's the evol evolutionary uh, process of how planets basically uh, are created in nebula or during star formation. The passing star mechanism of the origin of the star system was proposed by Buffon. Uh, he, the one who was basically proposed that. Okay. Three, which of the following observation would support the solar napular theory over the passing star hypothesis, proving that most of the star, like stars near the sun, also have uh, planets orbiting them. And I think two years ago in the uh, vicinity of Proxima Centauri or Alpha Centauri, I think they found planets orbiting an M star, which basically lends strong support for uh, uh, the natural solar theory. Which, uh, which one supports the solar nebula theory of the origin of the solar system? Well, disks are common around young stars, and I told you about the Orion Nebula, and it has been observed that you see dust disks or hot disks around young stars, and that basically gives support to the solar nebula theory. The oldest Rocks found on Earth are about 3.9 billion years old. I told you that the common age is 4.6 uh, billion years, but that based on rocks from the Earth, the Moon, uh, and uh, meteorites. On Earth here, there is a debate, uh, but I think uh, the oldest rock is about 3.9 uh, billion uh, years. And that basically use radioactive dating uh, to do that when explained that in the last lecture. Six, which of the following is not characteristic of the terrestrial planets? We can, we, in our solar system, we talked about two types, Jovians and terrestrial planet. Terrestrial planet basically have rocky surfaces. They do have atmospheres. They are smaller in size, smaller in mass, but they have high density, which is about five grams per centimeter cube. When we talked about Jovian, we told Jovian is basically are bigger. They're ma made of, uh, their surfaces are gaseous. You may have, there are some evidence there may be liquid inside the core, or you can go and look at the rings, and the rings you may also have ice and things like that. But actually the surfaces, you look at them and they're mostly gaseous, and that's how you say Jovian planets and they don't have their characteristics of course the low uh, average uh, density so when we look at these terrestrial planet orbit inside the asteroid belt and we talked about the asteroid belt it's between jupiter and mars uh, craters and all surfaces a small diameter very few satellites and satellites are meaning moons okay. but uh, the average density is not uh, low. That's characteristic of what of Jovian planets. So that's the right answer here. Seven, a meter is a solar system object that enters the Earth atmosphere and becomes very hot due to friction between the object and the Earth atmosphere. And I told you it makes a streak of light and we call that a shooting star. It's a wrong name for it. But whatever survives and reaches the Earth, basically we call that uh, uh, 
meteorites and we try to collect them and study them. Uh, uh, the age of the solar system is believed to be approximately, I made a mistake here, it's 4.6, not 4.7. Okay, 4.6 billion years based on data taken from samples of Loran, lunar rocks, samples from Earth uh, rocks, meteorites, actually all of the above. In observation, Uranus has heavy elemental core and a deep atmosphere, mostly made of hydrogen. Uh, we're just adding this, just I told you that the surface and the atmosphere are gases. Ten, the current atmosphere of the Earth is believed to be composed of gases that were baked from rocks sometime after the, plan, the planet formed. Usually, how did we get the atmosphere that we have here? on the surface of the earth of course the gravity that these gases not to escape from the earth and it's believed that's coming from uh, the rocks where they were had they are basically producing gases and so on the most important effect in cleaning the solar nebula of gas and dust was radiation of pressure remember what i told you you have a young uh, star and around the young star you have a dust disk so how will you push this away from uh, the star to form rings and then coalesce later taking small rocks we could less smallest and then they hit and they finally come to form the uh, planet that's what we call radiation pressure coming when the star ignites okay. And we'll probably we'll talk about this in chapter nine as well. This is uh, just to give you an idea of relative sizes and so on, and interesting uh, small mathematics problem. And a photograph of the moon, the moon measures 30 centimeters in diameter, and a smaller crater measures 0.2 centimeters. The moon's physical diameter is 1738 kilometer what is the physical diameter of this small crater that you can see these nice photos on the moon and so on so how big are these okay. now if uh, 30 uh, uh, centimeters okay, uh, that's the physical size of the moon on the photo or the image and the crater is about 0.2 centimeters. So if we take the physical uh, 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 moon and the diameter of it is about 1,738 kilometers. So what should the actual size or the diameter of the crater is? So you can do a cross multiplication here. So it would be uh, 1,738 kilometers multiplied by 0.2 centimeters divided by 30 centimeters of course centimeter will cancel centimeter and you get 11.52 kilometer so these small uh, features that you see on the moon well they look small because they're further away but they're huge and that's what basically led Galileo Galilei to say that the moon is not a perfect uh, spherical object like what the Greeks believed. Uh, 13, the speed of the solar wind is approximately 400 kilometers per second. And we'll talk about solar wind when we do that in chapter number uh, eight, but it just gives you an idea of how things move in our solar system. And the distance from the sun to Saturn is 9.5 AU, and one AU is equal 150 million kilometers which is 1.5 times 10 to the 8 kilometer how long does it take a particle in the solar wind to reach saturn now you all know that speed is equal distance divided by time so i have here t as equal to d divided by v so i will put in the distance from the sun to saturn which is 9.5 times 10 to the 18 times uh, uh, 9.5 for AU 
and each AU is 1.5 times 10 to the 8 kilometer. I divide that by 400 kilometers per second. That will give me 3,562,000 seconds. Now I can convert these seconds into hours and to minutes by dividing by 60. And then I can divide that by 60 to get it in hours. And then I can divide that by 24 hours to get it in dates. So that's approximately about 41.23 days. So the right answer is about 41 days. Just to tell you an idea of something that moves that fast, you know, probably the fastest car could be about 400 kilometers per hour. This is 400 kilometers per second. It's something that's coming from the sun. And these also come to us here on the earth, but we're lucky enough here on the earth to have the magnetic field to deflect them away. Otherwise, they can burn the atmosphere of the earth. And once we lose the atmosphere of the earth, then we cannot have liquid water and life will cease to exist. Uh, and we'll talk about solar winds when we uh, uh, talk about the sun in chapter number eight. 14, once a terrestrial planet had formed from large number of planets, smallest, and these are basically small rocks, and they hit and they change, and that's the process, that's why the age of uh, our Earth is about 4.6 billion years, so the process took a very long time. Heat from radioactive decay could have melted it and allowed it to differentiate into a dense metallic core and a lower density crust. We'll talk about uh, uh, the Earth maybe in chapter number seven, if we have a chance to do that. Um, I will do the sun first. Uh, uh, the Earth, probably all of you study this in school, that it has a core, and the core has an inner core, which is solid, and then you have a liquid core, which is made of iron, and then you have mantle, which is a uh, soft, hot material, and above that you have the crust, where we live on it. So basically, that's what we talk about differentiation here. How these layers have differentiated. You basically, if you ever mix oil and water, the oil will go on the top and the water will be low. And that's because of difference in density. So the same thing, you have something that's hot and they will cool down. So maybe the hot metal, and we'll talk about that later. It's when down, then the molten rocks and then basically you have the rocks with lower density on the top and they cool over time. So where is the source of that heat? It's most likely the radioactive decay. Uh, 15, a news release might report that a new planet has been found around the star, very similar to our sun. The newly discovered planet is uh, a diameter claimed to be have a mass of 40 times that of the Earth and is located nearly 25 AU from the star it orbits, which of the following would be a reasonable prediction about this planet? It has a mass 40 times that of the Earth. It basically orbits far away from the uh, planet, so we'd expect that to be a Jovian planet. So the planet will be probably have a radius of around five times to 10 times the greater than the Earth. The planet will probably have several satellites like Jupiter and Saturn. The planet will probably have a composition that is mostly hydrogen and helium. We're just basically trying to extrapolate to what we have here. So the answer here will be two, three, and uh, four. A good number of exoplanets thus far discovered around other stars are found by uh, I say a good number, okay, but now actually uh, most of the exoplanets that are discovered are discovered by the transient method. But I just put this one here just to show you that at the beginning 
okay it was basically the varying doppler shift that was used to do this so i may change this question to say most of exoplanets discovered thus far around other stars are found by transient method. 17 planets are thought to be forming today in hot disks around the stars and we saw that the t tori and there are some observation of that that gave strong evidence to the solar nebula theory 18 what observation made of other stars seem to suggest that the solar Capular hypothesis correct. Young stars are found to have hot disks that surround them. Venus is often called Earth's sister planet because it is similar to the Earth in terms of mass and size and density, so all of the above. Compared to terrestrial planet, Jovian planets, and the only thing that we have here have much larger diameter. The asteroid belt is found between which two planets? Between Mars and Jupiter. 22, if the catastrophic theory of the formation of the solar system is correct, then we would expect to find very few number of planetary system like our own. And I told you the confirmed number now is 4,401. And it's on the rise. So that's why the catastrophic hypothesis is not considered anymore. 23, how is radioactive dating used to determine the age of an object? Well, we look at the amounts of radioactive decay and decay material are compared to its half-life time to determine the age. 24, how is the presence of space debris accounted for by the solar uh, system model space debris is leftover material from the early solar system that never formed into a planet space debris was formed by the collision of objects after the planet formed so actually the answer here is a and b and that's how we got the uh, uh, we got the uh, asteroids, comets, and meter. And that's basically the review questions here for chapter number six, just as a discussion. And uh, the idea here is to know why this is the right answer. Is uh, So, uh, I in, in quizzes or, or exams, I can actually take any of these and I turn them around or I give you something different. Okay is to test your knowledge so in this chapter here we actually talked about our own solar uh, system uh, as i told you we're in astronomy we present how this system or solar system came in existence and we have the solar nebula theory and now there are evidence where you look in let's say the orion nebula and you can see something of that sort is going on. So that's give you a support for it. We surveyed the solar system. We talked about the different because we live here and we can do that. And then at the end, I showed you that we are not unique. There are other extrasolar planets, which we call exoplanets that orbit other stars. So we're not unique. And that brings in another question. Uh, are there any intelligent life out there? And if there is any intelligent life out there, uh, they will ask us and they will say, what are you? They're not going to ask, who are you? So that's an open uh, question. Maybe science will try to address these uh, points uh, later, but uh, something that is out there. Now, many times uh, you may hear the word that they found water on some planet and uh, this is a good sign. Now, the question is, is it liquid water? Ice uh, is not liquid water and you need liquid water to support life. So always you have to be cautious when you hear these things, is it liquid water or ice that because H2O 
as you all study in high school, it could be in three forms. It could be a vapor, which is a gas. It could be a liquid, which is water. It could be also ice uh, in a solid form. So this is basically uh, what I have here. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Is this clear? Any questions on this? Good. Very good.